started. It's 12.02 and um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, Chancellor's Environment Sustainability and Resilience Commission uh, Lunch and Learn. Uh, I've been looking forward to this since we uh, scheduled it back in January. Uh, we're going to hear today about the uh, innovations related to upcycling, recycling, and repurposing textiles and looking at this as a not only a global challenge, but also some uh, local opportunities in terms of how individually as well as collectively we can potentially get involved. Um, <clears throat> today we're uh, privileged to have three, uh, three speakers. Um, Haley Noldy is a graduate of the Environmental Studies Program at, uh, at UNL and she uh, interned at the Nebraska Recycling Council and has now elevated into the executive director position uh, over the last uh, about a year. It's already a year, huh? I know, Haley? that's crazy. <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun. That's for, yeah, uh, that's sure, for sure. sure. <laughs> um, then well, uh, we have uh, uh, Scott uh, Kuhlman and, and also his wife, um, Susan, are Nebraska alums and they've uh, spent some time working in this whole textile thing on the on the global scale. And um, after 30 years in Minneapolis and Italy in the footwear and fashion industry, they moved back to central Nebraska five years ago and they started this idea of uh, circular fashion and they founded a company called Recircled. Uh, which currently exists in Sydney, Nebraska, as well as in uh, Pareto, Italy, plus some other things that I think that he'll be telling us about in terms of his activities, which is fantastic. Um, and then we have uh, Dr. Uh, Yiki Yang, and hopefully I pronounced that right, um, or it was close anyway. Um, he is a uh, textile chemical engineer here at uh, at the university. He's the Charles Bessie Professor of Textiles and Biological Systems Engineering. And his research focuses on the development of bio-based fibers and chemicals and environmentally responsible uh, technologies. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn over the screen to, uh, to Haley and she's gonna, she's gonna kick, us, uh, kick us off. So Haley, the, go ahead and share your screen and we'll be ready to go. Thank you, let me figure out where I'm at here. Can you see how we can see? We can see your screen. Okay, what about, is that okay? Yep, that's perfect. All right. So good morning, everyone. Um, well, midday, I guess now. Um, my name is Haley, like Dave said. Um, I'm really excited to be here as a graduate of um, from UNL. Um, just excited to touch on what we know about textile waste. And this presentation is actually really timely because um, we just hosted a clothing swap. And as you can see in the photo, and then we're in the middle of some textile waste research that we're doing around the state. So, the Nebraska Recycling Council is a statewide member-based nonprofit. Our mission is to maximize the economic and environmental benefits of resource recovery. So what that means is we advocate for best practices with recycling, composting, and waste reduction. This involves things um, all the way from you know, our fall conference, where you, you can see a couple of photos there, um, to recycling events, to working with students on waste research projects, and much more. Um, in, that, in the top right corner, you can see two students that we worked with uh, last semester um, from the Environmental Studies program at UNL. So one of our most recent events was at uh, Nebraska Innovation Campus in partnership with Lincoln Earth Day. It was so much fun. We hosted a citywide clothing swap. So during the event, residents swapped almost 700 items. The intent of an event like this is to promote more sustainable habits when it comes to clothing and encourage everyone to swap or buy secondhand. And then, you know, that in turn diverts all of that material that would potentially be waste in the landfill. I wanted to touch on, um, you know, some of the bigger picture recycling stats that we have. So sharing our map of municipalities across the state, you can get a visual of where recycling is available. Uh, about one third of our communities in the state don't have access to recycling. A lot of the issues we see um, is 
recycling essentially being disproportionately more expensive in rural areas. I made a geo narrative that we put together. It's linked here. I don't know if my PowerPoint will be shared, but I can share it with anyone that wants it. Um, and that hosts just all uh, a plethora of information, um, kind of bigger picture recycling and what we know of. There is limited data available on textile recycling in our state. We know recycling is happening um, with textiles, but it's really hard to tell where it's going and how effective the recycling process is. Reci or recycling is difficult with clothing because it's made from all different types of material, which is much harder to responsibly dispose of than something like aluminum cans, which is made out of all of the same material. I'm sure Scott will probably touch on this. But another issue that with most clothing is that it's not made to be recycled, which of course causes issues for the purchasers um, when you're trying to figure out how to responsibly dispose of something, but the person that designed the item never intended for you to recycle it. So the photos here that you see are from recycling equipment grants um, used for textile waste uh, at their store type places around the state. NRC administers these grants uh, with funding from the Nebraska Environmental Trust. NRC, is, like I mentioned, is also conducting research on textile waste as part of a grant we received from the Nebraska Department of Environment and Energy. So unfortunately, I don't have a ton of current information on textile recycling, um, but I will as we get through uh, the project throughout the rest of the year. Um, yes, these are just photos from people who have utilized those grants. I am able to share the amount of textiles in our landfills. The last waste characterization from uh, for Nebraska was done in 2009 um, and found that 5% of our waste was textiles, which tracks with what um, Iowa's waste characterization last year found. They found that 6.3% of their waste is textiles or leather. I wanted to compare the two because Nebraska's study is relatively um, old and so it, it actually does track with what our neighbor is seeing in their waste stream. Um, this might not sound like a large percentage at first, but I ran the numbers yesterday and um, 860 tons of waste is sent to the local landfill at Bluff Road um, every day here in Lincoln. This means roughly 43 tons of recyclables or of textiles that could be recycled are thrown away here in Lincoln every day. That's 43 tons. And it goes to show that textile waste really is a big problem and it could be easily mitigated. So what can we do right now um, with that stat? Like I said, it's easy to mitigate. So what, what are the quick solutions that everyone on the call today can implement? Um, and that would just be avoiding, um, always avoid the overconsumption and fast fashion. So that's your like reduction part of reduce, reuse, recycle. Start there. Um, don't fall into the consumerist trap of needing to buy a new outfit for every single event. Um, you know, start there with avoiding overconsumption. Next, repair and upcycle what you already have. So fix your clothing, um, adjust your clothing to fit you better, uh, you know, take care of what you already own. Next, swap clothes with friends, family, or at a community event like NRC just hosted. Um, next, if you really need to buy something new, try to buy secondhand first. If you can't find what you're looking for buying secondhand, buy high quality clothing from ethical brands. Um, you know, be intentional with buying things that you actually like, that you're actually going to wear, that are going to last you a long time. They fit you well. Um, just that intention piece of what you're buying can help a lot. <laughs> and finally, just supporting responsible recycling and research that you we'll hear from the other two presenters. And that I believe is kind of most of what I have. I'm happy to answer any of the questions. I can dig into some of that recycling data a little bit more. Um, otherwise, I welcome follow up with my contact here.
Great, Haley, thank you. I think what we'll do is we'll maybe wait for the questions till the, maybe till the end, I think would probably okay. be best. Um, Dr. Yang, I think we'll have you, uh, we'll have you go next if that's okay. And uh, if Haley, there we go, Haley, stop sharing your screen. So the screen is yours, doctor. All right, can you see my slides? Yep, we see them. Okay. So we'll talk about textile uh, uh, recycling and what I will focus is fiber to fiber recycling as part of my presentations. So textiles has environmental challenges. Number one is the huge annual consumption. We're talking about 120 million metric tons per year. Uh, right now it's already more than that. Uh, doubled in 20 years. So imagine if we double that again in the next 20 years, we have a huge problem there just based on consumption. The second one is, of course, the environmental impact. Environmental impact during the production of fibers and chemicals such as dyes that we use for processing. And during slashing process, when we make the woven fabric, we have to use uh, polymers to protect the fibers. And those polymers are basically not degradable, so we discharge them all to our water. Then wet processing, dyeing, finishing. And in addition to that, we have our huge waste and afterlife textile challenges. Those are not just the landfill problems, but also the generation of micro and nanoparticles. Those particles are found in living creatures, in the brains of animals and in human. We found those little particles in everyone's drinking water. And plastics will generate these particles, but textiles will generate more just because we have much finer materials. We have fibers with a diameter of 10 micrometers. So they are much more easily degraded to those harmful particles than plastic materials. So those are our main challenges. And I'll talk about a little bit, since I have only 10, 15 minutes, about what we have done or what we are doing in our labs at UNL. Now, our efforts are mainly two folds. One is making fibers from agriculture byproducts and co-products. The beauty of that is these things are what we have already. When we grow grains for food, we have those already there. So we don't need to make those raw materials again. We just utilize the raw materials. Number two is we want to complete recycle waste and afterlife textiles, complete recycle means we are going for fiber to fiber recycling, not just the polymeric materials, but also the dyes. So here's just some examples of, we are making cellulosic fibers, the properties that were close to cotton, linen, and rayon. But what we do is we use cotton stock that's on the left. You see that garment is cotton stock fiber and cotton blend. We're talking about natural fibers. We did not do any chemical polymerization. We just extract the natural fibers from cotton stock and use the fibers to spin the yarns with cotton, then make the garments. This one, in the middle is corn husk fibers with cotton. Again, we can use the natural fibers from corn husks and blend it with cotton to make the yarns and then the garments. So those are the examples of natural cellulosic fibers from agricultural wastes or textile applications. Next will be the proteins. We have made fibers from chicken feathers, which is basically a waste, uh, and soy meals. So soybean, we can squeeze the oil for whatever applications and whatever left is protein rich material. So we can extract the proteins and make the fibers. Right now we have a UK student just granted 
So she will help us to knit some garments out of chicken feather, yarns. We've made the fibers and we have made the yarns. 100% pure from chicken feather, 50-50 with rayon and silk. So we'll see. Once we make the garments, we'll see how do they perform. So that's what we are doing our labs in terms of solving the fiber problems. Try to use less synthetic materials. Those are basically not degradable materials. So uh, in addition, we try to utilize the wastes uh, from our agriculture. And the next one, of course, is the afterlife textiles. If we produce 120 million tons worldwide, we basically will generate 120 million tons at least of the waste every year, if you see that as a balance over years. Right? So recycling is a big issue. Right now, what we do recycling, like Haley was talking about, basically is a garment to garment recycling. We use the old garment, do it in a way to let it have the second life. But a more fundamental research is, can we do it fiber to fiber? Meaning we can make new Young's fabrics that make new garments out of the old garments or other textiles. So that's what we try to do. But the number one challenge for doing so is you have to remove the dyes. If you don't remove the dyes, you want to use it as this, then you have very limited quality and applications. Give you an example. People try to depart, just deteriorate the blue jeans, right? So they use mechanical method to get the garment into fibers mechanically, use those sharp needles, try to separate them and then make new denims, which is in practice in the United States already. But the issue here is if you imagine, if we use a mechanical method to separate the fibers from a garment, you will break the fibers. So that later when you make the garments again, of course you have to make the yangs, the fibers are too short. In textiles, we want the fibers to be about an inch to make a good yarns. But once those cotton fibers are broken, then they're not an inch long. So what you have to do is you have to add virgin cotton fibers to help make the yarns. But what if you want it to have the third life? Then it becomes very, very problematic. So what we try to do is not damaging the materials, but the challenge is to remove the dyes. If you don't remove the dyes, you have very limited applications and we can do that successfully. All the dyes you can think of, the main five, six, seven dye classes, we have done that already in the lab. So once the dyes are removed, then the removed dye can be reutilized in the white, fibers can easily be regenerated into new textile materials. And we can do that not just to the garment, but also to carpets and other, we call them composites. Like Scott knows what composites mean. So, so, so textile actually is a composite itself with the button zipper and all the other things. But if we can remove the dyes, we can purify the fibers from a complicated composite and then re-spin the fibers, make the yarns and fabrics. I'll show you a schematic. Here's what we have done. And these are the true figures from our labs. From the left, we have a polycotton. Polycotton is the most popular blends and the most used textile fabrics for Aperos, so polycotton blend. 100% cotton is easier to recycle, but polycotton is the challenge. So we use polycotton as an example. So what we have to do is we find a solvent, which is not toxic, right? To dissolve polyester and disperse dyes. Disperse dyes are the dye that we use for polyester. 
All right. So what we have is have a liquid which has polyester and dispersed dyes in it, and cotton is still the solid. So we can have the cotton fabric out, which of course has its dye on, which is a blue. Then for polyester, we have a controlled precipitation. We can precipitate polyester and leave the dyes in the solvent. So you can see from here, I have my arrow here, right? You can have the white polyester and the liquid with dispersed dyes. So now this way we separate polyester from its dyes and we separate the cotton with its dyes. Then the next thing to do is use some liquid to swell the cotton fabric to remove its dye easily. Now we get the white cotton and the cotton dye, which if it's a reactive dye, if you know the textiles, then the dye cannot be used for cotton anymore, but the dye can be easily used as an acid dye for nylons and proteins. So that's what we did. We used the dye to dye nylon. And the cellulose now it's a clean material. So we re-extrude it through the lyocell process to make the cellulose fibers clean so you can use it as new fibers and make other textiles. Now let's go back to disperse. Polyester is simple. We can melt spin to get the polyester fibers and the properties are as good as the new ones. We characterize all of them. And the dye, we can re-dye the polyester fiber because it's dispersed dye, you can reuse it for polyester. So that's the so-called complete fiber to fiber recycle. And, and we have done that not just to polycotton, we have done that to almost all the materials already in our labs. So the next thing is hope some companies will be interested in this. If it's not in US, I know European companies are very interested in this kind of technology. And we have demonstrated that already. And we can use that to recycle all the fibers from carpets, which is another main concern for us, right? In the US, we have wall-to-wall -wall carpets and we have to change them frequently, at least once in 10 years, if, especially if you have pets. And right now it's just landfill. Uh, we can of course use that for composite materials. We study that in our labs, carpet is ideal for composites, right? but also we can get all the fibers out and carpet has a lot of fibers. Uh, so we can get the fibers out and then reuse them as new fibers. And the dyes, of course, reuse them. So that's what we have done in our labs. Dr. Yang, thank you very much. That was very uh, enlightening, I guess, would be, a, I think that's a minimum word that I would use, but that was fantastic. And I'm sure that Scott has got some, I could just see Scott's eyes lighting up as you were talking. So I'm sure that he has some very, uh, he'll make some commentary, but Scott, I will turn over the. We'll let me, let me hide mine, I guess. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. Or just unshare, I guess. Uh, I don't have enough to see that. <laughs> let me get, uh, get this bigger so I can do it. Okay, I'll unshare this one. Can only share without unshare. <laughs> Stop sharing. Okay. There we go. Perfect. All right, Scott, the floor or the screen is yours, I should say. Okay, here we go. Let's share that. Hopefully, guys. All right. Um, so here we go. So uh, thank you. I'm Scott Kuhlman. I'm a uh, UNL alum from a long time ago. And um, as, as uh, Dave said, I've spent my lifetime in footwear and fashion, uh, mostly on the new production side for 30 years. I'm, I'm the one responsible for um, literally billions of garments um, being produced. Uh, and then three years ago, um, read a document from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation that pointed out um, what a bad person um, we've been and um, believe it and looked into it and the idea of circular fashion came around. Um, I have a background of working with luxury fashion companies 
And so um, that's who we're, we're starting with and, and working with to develop the processes and systems. And we're doing it right here in, in Nebraska. Um, over the last three years, we've had um, uh, companies from Curing, um, LVMH, uh, VF Corp, Patagonia, all the way down to Target and Walmart visit us here in, in Nebraska um, to see the activities that we're doing. Um, I'll, I'll blow through these. I've, I've got a bunch of slides, but I'll, I'll go through them. Um, here's just a, a little group of, of companies that we work with one-on-one. Um, -on -one, there's a lot more. There's about over 75 companies now that, that we're um, in the process of working with. Um, in Sydney, we took over the uh, old distribution centers at uh, of Cabela's. Um, if you don't know what they are, they're cool old buildings that were built in World War II um, that um, we are repurposing. Basically, uh, we call it our playground for um, all things upcycling, recycling with um, footwear and uh, apparel. We have gotten into other things like sporting equipment um, for Vail Resorts. We've worked on helmets, poles, skis, uh, boots, et cetera. Um, we're working with Timex right now on watches. Um, so we are, are extending into some other product categories. Um, I, I want to start with just some photos. Here's just a, a photo of our, um, and I want to show you what we're moving to. Um, this is how it all started. We're just great big tables. And these are um, uh, construction boots that we are disassembling. Um, we've realized with the recycling, disassemble into components. Um, we have a very good opportunity of recycling them to high, high quality products. Um, you can see where this is a very manual process. Um, in June, the first automation um, will be installed. Um, we worked with a robotics company to develop um, the first single arm robot that will disassemble um, the first shoe. Um, they're going to be very, very simple. It'll be sneakers. Um, think of like van style sneakers um, are the first ones that will, will come out of this automated disassembly process. Um, this is what a, a, a apparel disassembly looks like. Um, they, I think they're literally uh, cutting apart uh, or detrimming, uh, as Dr. Yang talked about. Uh, trims are the are the bane of the existence of, of textile recycling. So zippers, buttons, um, labels um, have to come off. And this is what we're doing manually. Um, the cool thing is this is moving to automation as well. Um, and hopefully you can see the video. Let me let me play it. Um, see if it plays for everybody. Can you guys see the video? It's playing. Okay. Anyway, you can see the automation to it. This does not have the automated automated um, de trimming with it, um, but it's coming shortly. Um, you don't need to see the whole thing. You can get the gist of what's happening, but there's a lot of movement around um, the, the automated um, sorting, um, not only um, reading uh, uh, fiber content and color, but then also doing the detrimming for us at the same time. Um, one of the things, uh, and again, Dr. Yang spoke about you know composites and so forth. Um, we know that um, there's always going to be a lot of textile waste and parts and pieces and things we can't use. And so we spent a lot of time working on um, other processes. So even though textile to textile recycling is the ultimate goal of everything, it's what can we what can we do with all the stuff that we can't get textile to textile. Um, and um, this is where uh, let me get to there. So you know, this is kind of the goal, which which he showed as well, is that it's it's, it's fabric that we get into fiber that we ultimately get into yarns. Um, that is utopia, and we try that with everything. Um, what we've discovered though is that there's other things, and 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 we believe the building industry, construction industry, um, will be the user of a lot of our products, and so we've developed um, on the bottom. You can see these are composite type materials. Um, they're 90% textile waste and 10% binders. Um, we've also discovered a way to injection mold this same product. So think of things like hangers. And so we give the vision to uh, particularly big box retailers like Target and Walmart. Imagine the day that all the hangers in your stores are made from your own waste. Um, it's entirely possible to do today. And, and that's the process and the systems that we're trying to build. Um, so how do we do all this? Um, we are, are building the process right now um, for what the industry is calling take back. 
Um, so we believe that that um, moving forward and in the future that as you buy products from brands, when you're finished with them, you will give them back to whom you bought them from. And that's a process that we're building. Um, we built both an online system um, that brands can plug into their e-commerce where you go online, you tell them you're done with your product and it, and it spits out a shipping label. Um, it created the same experience in store um, for those that have a bricks and mortar store. Um, the way that we think about it is uh, we simply have to reverse engineer the process. So if you think of a garment, a shoe, um, whatever it is, you basically have a bunch of parts that come together in an item. What we have to do is take that item and take it apart. Um, that's, that's what we have to do to get it into the components that we have to do. With, with the idea of circularity, that means getting those components then back into the supply streams of the, of, of the brands and the retailers that produce that item. And so in a second, you'll see a little bit around that. Um, and so what that means is literally we're creating inventory buckets of these components. You know, so imagine, you know, a vans where we're collecting all the, the cotton twill from the upper and we're creating inventory levels um, uh, that they can and have the opportunity to create a circular system with and bringing that cotton twill back into their supply stream at some point in time. Um, and so this is just a, a quick graphic of, you know, uh, again, we can blow over that one pretty quickly, but what is the process? It's just taking an item, it's taking it apart. Um, we can mechanically recycle it, chemically recycle it. Um, with, with what Dr. Yang's working on, that is utopia for a lot of us. Um, and, and we can get it back into a, a product that we can reuse um, in, in some way. It's entirely possible today, as, as he demonstrated, um, and we are doing it at, at scale. Um, the other thing that we're working on um, a lot with our, our customers and brands is um, circularity is a fantastic idea. The problem is no one thought it through the end, and nobody knows the cost of it. And so what we do is we work with our, our companies, again, very, very closely, and we're creating calculators um, around the cost of, of what, is, what does this take? So, for instance, we work in the footwear industry uh, a lot. We have an incredible um, way to recycle leather today. Um, and so we can show and demonstrate to somebody like a coach, handbags, that if they send us 10,000 handbags, we know how much leather we can harvest off of it. And we know the costs that it, it takes to get it through to create one square foot of recycled leather. Um, the other part of it that we're building along with it is not only the financial cost, but the environmental cost is what does this take to get it actually recycled back into a square foot of leather? Um, and so really we're looking at that as a decision-making tool around this idea of circularity so that brands have a, uh, a, an online tool at their disposal um, that they can look at to help themselves um, make decisions on what is the right thing to be doing with all this stuff that, that we're creating. Um, what we've, we've done is, is uh, here in Sydney is we've created what um, is the first, uh, again, companies are flying all, you know, all over the place to look at um, it's what we're calling the refactory. Um, we believe that not only do we need this one building in Sydney, we see the day where there literally be thousands of these buildings across the world. Um, we're partnering with companies like Waste Management here in the United States with Toyota in Asia um, to um, see the vision of this refactory through. And this is just a schematic of, of what a refactory is. And it's basically for textiles, footwear, and accessories to go into and then what happens inside the building? What is the process that goes on to pre-process all of this inventory and all of these parts and pieces and where do they go? Um, this is just a, a quick vision of, of how we see the first you know, 50 to 100 of them where they will be. Um, we have company, we have countries like Switzerland um, who are deep in the process of, of um, building out the first refactory. Um, we have um, uh, uh, nonprofits like the RK Mellon Foundation of Pittsburgh who are doing the same thing. Um, and so it's really, really cool to see. Um, behind all of this is this technology stack that we've built. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty incredible system where not only do we um, offer upcycling in the fact that we believe that cleaning and repair is a big part of this, 
And so when items come to our building, the first thing that we do is we assess them. If we can, if they can be cleaned and repaired, we have basically for footwear, a giant cobbler shop here where we clean and repair footwear. And we have a huge sewing center where we um, uh, clean and repair garments. That's first. Um, what we've learned after doing about 3 million items last year, less than 10% of them we can save. Um, so over 90% needs to go to recycling. Um, so we do, um, even though upcycling is first, um, we, we do spend a lot of time on the, on the recycling. Um, this is just a, a quick, and I won't go through it all. This is a dashboard that we give all of our retailers. Um, we equate it, if you're familiar with, with software like Salesforce and marketing, um, what we're really building out where that's a decision-making tool for marketers, um, we're building out the equivalent of that around um, textile and footwear circularity so that a brand will literally have this at their fingertips um, to, to work with. And again, this is just some high level um, screenshots uh, of what it is. Um, and so you can kind of see what we're doing. It's pretty incredible, you know, seeing the work that, that, um, that, that UNL is doing around textile, textile fibers. Um, and then, you know, what we're doing here in Sydney, you know, um, good old Nebraska is literally becoming the center of a lot of, of what's happening uh, and going on. So um, with that, I will, we can open it up to questions, I guess. Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Scott. Um, I have a question, and I guess this is really a question for both Scott and, and Dr. Yang in terms of the, 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 the the economics of the process that Dr. Yang was talking about in terms of it actually being, if you will, incorporated into what Scott's doing. Um, I'll let you guys banter back and forth about that, but uh, I, I'm curious about that part of the conversation. Right, so I will say first, Scott, you, you may answer that question for your applications. What we have calculated was only the material, energy, and water chemical costs. So compared to say, what pulp, our cost to recycle cotton in terms of those costs is only 30%. If you talk about the price of the pulp, that's even more expensive. And our cotton, if we use it as a pulp for lyocell fiber, has much better quality and which is much cheaper, about 30% of the cost. Now, regarding all the others, it's still cheaper, but I haven't done that calculation yet. Even polyester, what we are doing is much cheaper. So when we did all these development, of course, cost is the second most important thing. Number one, of course, is the environmental impact. We're not going to generate new environmental problems to solve the old one. Number two is the cost. If the cost is not there, there's no hope. So that's what we do, right? The most is 30% of the cost. Um, yeah, the, the best example and, and you know, what we we discovered is around um, when we're talking about textile Recycling and textiles a textile is um, the, the ultimate goal for everybody. As a matter of fact, I was just in New York at a conference on Monday and Tuesday. Um, there's a, a, a firm called um, um, CXL, and you can look it up. They're they're being challenged, and they're they're throwing out a challenge right now. Um, whether it's going to be prize a, a very significant prize money around textile to textile recycling, um, and we are working on what that's going to be. But um, a lot of effort being thrown at it. What we've discovered with the cost of um, recycled materials um, today, if you go in and want to buy recycled polyester, recycled cotton, recycled cashmere, um, it's it's typically more expensive than virgin. And what we know is a lot of it is, is around the process of it. Um, so the example that I'll give, there's a, a very large chemical polyester recycler in, in Tennessee called Eastman. Um, Eastman has, has been doing this. Um, they have a beautiful polyester yarn called Naya. Naya is expensive, and it's expensive because of the way that Eastman has to develop and produce the Naya yarn. And it's simply around feedstock, is that they don't have enough feedstock on a daily basis um, to keep the process going and moving and create efficiencies within it. 
And that's what we're finding with everything is that um, there's processes to recycle all of this. Typically, they're very large. There's very micro, there's very few micro processors um, within textile recycling. Um, and we are seeing some pop up where they can produce smaller quantities and so forth and create efficiencies. But so we work on this process is how do we how do we get Eastman their feedstock every single day, um, you know, so that they can drive the price down? Um, you know, it's just it's literally with everything um, that we're finding is what is the process? We know that once we get the process correct, um, we will drive it down at the moment. It is more expensive. We are finding, though, more and more companies and brands are willing to pay more and just kind of write off the, 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 the additional cost to ensure that we can get this process going. So it's very encouraging. Well, what currently available on pilot or industrial scale production is what I call it polymer to polymer recycle, which right. is actually developed by DuPont in the yeah. 80s last century. What that process does is they depolymerize say polyester. So they have monomers, small, particles, small chemicals, uh, building blocks. Then they use distillation method to get them out and then repolymerize the monomers. And that process is extremely costly. So if you pay attention to what I said is we did not touch the polymers. We use the polymers, we skip that separation, purification, and repolymerization process. That's why we can make it cheaper. But the challenge here is how to remove the dyes. <laughs> DuPont did was they, they did not think of removing the dyes. But fortunately, we're dyers here. So we know exactly how to remove the dyes. <laughs> Once the dyes are removed, we can utilize the fibers and the polymers directly to save a lot of money. That's why I said our process is much cheaper than if you want to remake. Of course, it's much cheaper than the currently available processes, which is depolymerization, separation purification, repolymerization, all those processes, we just skip them. That's why they are so costly. Yeah. The, the other issue that we have around all of this is logistics, is that um, we know that this is a decentralized um, system, and it has to be. And uh, moving around, you know, waste is not a, you know, doesn't make sense. And so that's where uh, a lot of the processes we're trying to do is also make it so it's decentralized. We know in the beginning, you know, so imagine a day that um, you know we we could commercialize, uh, you know, what Dr. Yang and, and the team at UNL have done. Um, we'll have to open one location, right? So, um, but there needs to be hundreds of them, honestly. And so that's where we're looking at uh, not even the 30,000 foot idea, we're looking at the stratospheric idea of, of how can we literally take care of the 100 billion garments that are produced every single year. Um, and I don't know, Dr. Ian, you agree, but it sounds like with the work you've done, it's possible, it really is. There's a lot of hope around it. Well, the logistics shouldn't be a problem because right now all the waste needs to go to landfill and that's transportation also. If we can do that logistics and let it go to certain plants, and what you said, if it's uh, distributed throughout the country, throughout the world, it's more ideal. But the cost can be high because your production scale is small. You have right. large production, then you can save the cost to cover the transportation costs. So, so, so there are different ways to think that. Yep. But I don't think logistics should be a barrier. And it's easy to solve that problem. Yep. Other, other questions? Yes, hi. Um, I have a question. Uh, my name is Ritu, and I'm a student here at UNL. Um, I work on projects related to sustainability and recycling. I was just curious to know and learn from the panelists, um, how do consumers perceive products created from these recycled materials, are they open to buying? And uh, this is one of the research projects I'm working on. And uh, I have another question. Thank you for sharing your facilities. I was wondering if you offer any tours for students to come and visit uh, where uh, all this magic of recycling happens. Thank you. Yeah, no, we, yeah, we have visitors every every week, I should say. So um, we're happy to, it's uh, it's again, it's, it's um, 
it's it's a lot of manual stuff, but you can see a lot of a lot of things that we were thinking about and working on. So we do have a lot of consumer data. Most of it is around not necessarily the, the products, um, but it's around this take back process. Um, and uh, you know, brands are offering incentives to do that to get the things back. Um, we can tell you that younger demographics um, do not need an incentive um, to to make this happen. So um, you know the uh, you know, in in new commerce, they talk about last mile is getting the is getting the product you know uh, delivered to the home. What we talk about is first miles. How do we get it out of the home and where does it go to? Um, is what we try to solve. Um, you know, for old people like me, I need incentive to change my ways. Um, you know, for my twenty something daughters, they demand it. You know, if they're not buying from somebody that doesn't offer this. So uh, again, there's there's hope around that and and. Uh, it's all, in, in our opinion, is demographic driven um, at the moment. And, um, you know, don't plan on, you know, the older demographic. It's, it's going to take some work, but I think through time, um, it's going to evolve quickly. And obviously with, um, you know, we work with company like Allbirds and um, so forth that have a, um, a lot of information around that. We can tell you that um, and and there's a lot of publications out there where again younger demographics will pay more, um, you know, for materials and products that that have um, recycled you know content in it. Um, you know, there's no doubt about it. Well, congratulations, Ritu. First of all, to the two awards you have received at this college meeting this morning. Uh, they mentioned your name twice. Very proud of you. Now, to answer your first question, it's simple, right? If the price is same or even lower, if the qualities are exactly the same and with the recycling label, you think consumers are not going to buy it? I don't worry about that. Right? The only issue here is the quality and the price, right? So if we can solve these two problems, uh, then it shouldn't be a problem later. We can actually ask for more to make a better profits from the recycling label. And, and Dr. Yang brings up a great point. Up to this point, a lot of the, particularly around textiles, um, because he talked about shortening the yarn. And so there's been a lot of mechanical recycling. And in Prato, Italy, they've been mechanically recycling for a hundred years. It's shortening the yarn. Um, shortening and, the fibers, not the, the fiber. I'm mean, not the yarn, the fiber, excuse me. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, we work with a lot of luxury companies, um, particularly in the cashmere space. And so if you think of cashmere, um, you know, good, nice, long fiber, and then we mechanically recycle it, we make it really short. And so that's where um, particularly the luxury companies at the moment are not willing to use recycled um, content because it is inferior at the moment in a lot of cases with the, because of the recycling processes and methods. Um, so they just are not willing to use it. Um, and so that's hopefully, you know, through the work that, um, you know, the, you all are doing, um, we can we can solve that. So, yeah. Um, it, yeah, you're absolutely right. If you use a mechanical separation, then you damage the fibers. Once the fibers are damaged, of course, the quality of the later textile products won't be good. But there are always ways. Uh, that you can you can do something without damaging them. Uh, we are developing a process in my lab to make those thicker fibers, which are now the waste, like the meat goat. Right, we too probably know that. In your country, people eat a lot of uh, goat muttons. So you have a lot of those animal hair. They are too thick to be used for textiles, and we actually have developed a method, a process that it can stretch them, make them longer and finer. See, now the problem can be solved. If you really want to find cashmere fibers, you may use some coarser fibers through a technology we have developed to make longer and finer protein fibers, which is still hair fiber. Uh, and, and there are a lot of opportunities, but if you only use the mechanical separation method, like the denim, like wool, then you have problems later. I do agree. Cassia, do you have a question? I see you popped your picture on, so I assume you wanted to say something. 
Yes, I did have a question. Um, I work at CCC in the Environmental Sustainability Department, and my name is Kasia. Uh, I was wondering for Scott in particular. Um, I know that I noticed you mentioned extrusion or an extrusion printing process. Um, can do you think it would be possible to three D print using the extruded materials, or is that already what you're doing? Uh, for uh, for recycled. Yes. Yeah, no, we're we're using extrusion um uh really around um a lot of the so we, we work on a lot of packaging and things like that at the moment. So um you know we are working um uh, around that. We have not gotten into 3D printed products at all. Um uh our our goal is to um you know, the way to think of recycled is we're building the pre-processing. So what's missing within the textile footwear accessory industry um, is really what is called pre-processing. It's getting all this stuff ready for the ultimate recycling process. And so, um, and that's what's being recognized is that um, if you ask the question, if not the landfill, where? And that's what we're solving for is that the where is a building and then it's what happens inside the building. Um, our goal is just to is to figure out the process so we can get all of this ready for the ultimate, you know, recycling, whatever it's going to be. So um, uh, th that's what we're we're solving for. Well, to answer your question, if your 3D printer is set to have temperature at about 600 Fahrenheit, 600 degree Fahrenheit, then certain used textiles can be used like polyester. So we can have polyester and extrude them into these, we call them noodles for 3D printing. And you can use these noodles for 3D printing. But the issue here is normally your noodles can melt at lower temperature. So about 400 degree Fahrenheit, you're comfortable. But for polyester, you have to have at least 500 degree Fahrenheit to make it useful. So just, just the machine, the answer is yes, you can use them, but you have to, separate different polymers. We say thermoplastic materials like polyester, like nylons. You can certainly use them. Once you can make the noodles, you can use them easily. Okay. Thank you. So I have a question, Haley, when you, show, you showed your map earlier with regards to, um, I mean, obviously, well, first of all, I guess from a, from what you're talking about, Scott, of having these various these various plants in different places, you're kind of shortening the distance, if you will, that that you would have to transport your materials to, so that you could do your thing. When you're talking about a place like Nebraska, and Haley showed her basically who's recycling and who's not, a lot of that has to do with with a the the co the logistical costs, and so is. I guess what sorts of thinking has gone into, I guess I'm going to just talk about the urban rural divide, so to speak, because that's kind of what we're kind of what we're, you're talking about. I'm just curious in terms of what, how well, that kind of plays in. But from what I understand right now, you're not accepting from thrift stores and things like that in Nebraska. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, would be like a future thing, Dave, like some right. type, how we would, we, I'm inserting myself into Scott's business, but how that would be, um, you know, identified on like hub and spoke collaboration. It's actually a question I had for you, Scott, in like, if, I guess, how would the logistics side of that, would you envision like it would work better with, let's say, um, brand take back programs and then those brands ship to you or would that be something like working with thrift stores and then at the thrift stores that's where they sort types of materials it's because like I touched on the materials is the hard part like right. residential that's hard because it's just all mixed in together we're not talking about one type of material coming from you know one brand yeah, so uh, I mean, huge discussion around that, and um, and no one's solving for that. And and the the top line question is, um, we know we have to keep out of the landfill, um, or we we hope we can. That's the whole goal. Um, so if we can do that, who's going to pay for it? Um, ultimately, the consumer is going to pay for it. You're either going to pay pay for it in 
um, a higher price of goods where there'll be a line item built into the cost of goods sold, you know, for each brand. Um, or you'll be paying your municipality, you know, a higher higher fee for pickup of, of waste. Um, companies like Waste Management who pick up at, you know, 25 million households every week, they believe that um, curbside pickup um, will happen in the future with ar around this. If you look at you know, states like Massachusetts, where they, in November they did outlaw putting putting textiles and mattresses and and um, footwear and accessories um, in the garbage. So, where does it go? What does it do? Did you uh, did you ever hear like what happened with that? Like the yeah, no, I know, yeah, I know. I, wait till we're working, we're working, actually working with the state of Massachusetts. I right remember now. they kind of like were scrambling to figure out, okay, what do we do with it now that we just banned it? Yeah. They still don't know. So it's a, it's a huge, okay. it's, a, it's a huge problem. You know, that was a, you know, that was a, uh, you know, fire before they aimed kind of mm -hmm. thing. And, and um, so we, we think it's going to be an obviously big, massive evolution and it's going to happen in lots of different ways. And so as, as um, we can roll out things like Dr. Yang is working on um, to have it commercially, again, it's just his first mile. How do, how do we get it? Where does it go? Um, you know, uh, we know it can happen. Um, and as Dr. Yang saying, logistics should not be a problem. You know, that's e easily solvable around this. Um, I don't, you know, we don't think that these take back programs for brands will ever, uh, you know, hit the scale. You know, there's no way that they'll be able to hit the scale. Thank you. They have to. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we know that. Um, the only reason why we promote it is just, it's a start and it's, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it's more than one's greater than zero you know, kind of thing. Um, environmentally, it doesn't make sense when you're putting one item in a FedEx box and shipping it back. That's just, that's crazy. So, um, so we know it's going to evolve. Um, I don't think anybody has the answer to it yet. Um, the, the, uh, we just, we're just voting the fact, let's get the process, unlike Massachusetts, let's get the process set up, um, make it efficient, effective, and know what we can do with it at a very high level and, um, and roll out all the, all the possibilities like like Dr. Yang has already proven they can be done. So um, there's just not enough of that happening right now. Well, in terms of how to collect them, I'll give you an example, right? There's a company called Wellman. They extrude fibers from polyester bottles in the 80s, starting 70s. In the 80s, they had large scale production already. If they can collect all the bottles for their major plan for production, I think for us to collect textiles shouldn't be a major challenge. Be a problem, yeah. I mean, if anyone can collect all the bottles for production in the yeah. 80s, last century, right? Yeah. So that's and we are Wellman. Wellman and the company did it. Yeah, long, we long are time. working, we are working with the two great big retailers in this country, um, Walmart and Target, um, to be the the instigators. We think they can be the a big start of this just based upon their their drop-off points. Obviously. You know, where, you know, in, you know, Hershey, Nebraska, there's no Walmart. So, you know, what's going to happen, you know, to that. So, again, I, it's going to evolve. Um, it just, as we say, start and, um, and, and we'll figure it out as we go. Well, we've come to the end of our time. I want to thank uh, Haley Scott and, and uh, Dr. Yang for joining us today. This has been fantastic. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, very, very interesting stuff. Um, this concludes the, uh, the, the series for this, uh, for this semester. Look forward to everybody joining us next, uh, next fall with some more exciting, uh, exciting stuff. Scott, we need to set up a, a meeting. Yeah. Uh, Haley, we've got, I, I've got a question for you that we can take offline. And um, anyways, thanks every, everyone. Anna, can you actually turn over, can you turn over control to me so I can talk to Haley? That would be great. I'm